In this episode of the Church Security Roll Call, we're going to be discussing lessons learned from the Conception Abbey shooting. Stay tuned. Hi, this is Chris with Sheepdog Church Security, and this is your Church Security Roll Call. Today we're going to be discussing the article, The 2002 Conception Abbey Shooting. If you'd like to read that article, go to our website, sheepdogchurchsecurity.net, and look under the News tab. So let's begin in the Bible. This is Ephesians 4, verse 26, and it reads like this. Be ye angry, and sin not. Let not the sun go down upon your wrath. Good verse for us today because the motive for this murder, this mass shooting, was very likely resentment. And we all know that resentment, anger, is one of the reasons people will commit murder. You know, somebody is offended by another person or maybe even an organization or they just perceive that this person or this organization did something bad against them. And it can cause them to become violent. And sometimes it's immediate, sometimes it's days, weeks, months, years, even decades later, they're still holding on to this resentment and it's building and building and building until it gets to a breaking point and that's when they commit murder. So before we continue, I'm going to recommend that you share this video with the rest of your team, staff, and other high capacity volunteers at your church and have a discussion about these lessons learned. I think it's going to be very helpful for you, your team, your staff, your entire church. All right, so let's get in the details of this. Um, shortly before 840 on a Monday morning, June 10th, 2002, a 71-year-old man dressed in blue work clothes and a cap carried two boxes into the Basilica of Conception Abbey, a Benedictine monastery and school in Conception, Missouri. He set the boxes down, took out two firearms, a replica AK-47 and a sawed-off 22 rifle. Um, he went in to a hallway that was just outside the office area. He shot a monk and three priests. The monk and one priest died. The other two priests survived. After shooting these four, the killer went back into the basilica where he fatally shot himself with the 22 rifle. Um, motivation. The motive for the deadly shooting at Conception Abbey is still a mystery. Examination of records showed no connection between the shooter and the monastery. Most think that it was resentment from the treatment of the Roman Catholic Church after a divorce decades earlier, while a few wonder if the shooter had been abused when he was a teen. Uh, the, shoot, um, the shooter was born in 1930 in Kansas City, about 80 miles south of Conception. He was not raised Catholic, but sometime in his youth became a devout member. He joined the army after high school. Following his discharge, he worked in Kansas City. In 1953, he was baptized in the Methodist Church, and in 1954, a year later, he was married in a Baptist Church. His marriage did not last long. Uh, they divorced four and a half years later in 1959. Uh, Twenty years later, after their divorce, um, 1979, the Catholic Diocese granted them an annulment. According to the shooter's daughter and brother, he was upset with how the church treated him because of the divorce. No details were reported, but it appears that, um, uh, that it may be that the delay in getting the annulment was the problem. Um, the other thing, the question, possible motive, the question about um, him possibly being sexual, sexually abused as a teen. While a lot of this was going on at that time and reporting was almost zero in, those, in the 50s, um, it's still just speculation, right? So there's no evidence to support that, though anything's possible. The other issue, of course, is mental illness. However, he had never been diagnosed with mental illness. So once again, we're kind of speculating here because obviously even today, a lot of people have undiagnosed mental illness. Um, but he was definitely undiagnosed and there's no proof of mental illness. Um, divorcing his wife probably does not count as mental illness. Um, at the time of the shooting, the man lived in a retirement community. His neighbors described him as not friendly, more of a loner. His relatives never visited him. 
he hadn't seen his brother and his daughter in years, even though um, they did not live far away. So here we have somebody at least with some social challenges based on uh, what we have here. All right, following it. Of course, there was wide sh um, widespread shock and mourning for the slain priest and monk. The abbey was closed for two days during the police investigation and cleanup. Since the details of the shooting were fairly clear, the investigation primarily focused on motive, which we're already kind of talked about. The first potential motive was that they looked at was, uh, was he a victim of sexual abuse? Uh, years earlier. However, records did not reveal any point of contact between the killer and the Abbey before that morning. Um, then his daughter and brother um, talked about the divorce and the annulment taking so long. Um, so what are the lessons learned here? Basically what we have here is almost very little connection, very loose connection, right? So um, so the, the shooting there, of course, was completely unseen. There were no threats. The gunman was totally unknown to those in the Abbey. He drove about 70 to 80 miles north to Conception from where he lived for the attack. Um, he was dressed like, um, like he was a repairman. Um, I mean, basically, there's really no real connection. And so the lessons learned here is this, is... This is why it's so important for us to have other safety protocols that are always in effect. You know, think about your church during the week, and maybe the secretary's there, and maybe the, the pastor, and maybe a few other handful of other people that are working. And the common practice for a lot of houses of worship is the doors are just unlocked, and people are coming and going, and things are going on, and it's really just chaos. Instead, what we have to do, because we don't know if a killer like this is coming to our church, and we can't know if a killer like this is coming to our church under these circumstances. It's, it seems very random, unpredictable. Um, and so we have to have some sort of safety protocol. Now, some very good ones, some basic ones, is exterior doors are remain locked during the week when it's just the staff that's there. One of the things that we can do for delivery people, repairmen, and all that good stuff is put in some sort of camera and doorbell system. You know, have people walk up, maybe have a sign, you know, during business hours or whatever, you know, push, you know, ring doorbell or whatever. And so that way we can at least have some barrier of monitoring who's coming in and out of the church. Now, we could go much further than that. You know, if somebody says, hey, I'm here to see, you know, the pastor. Okay, great. You know, stand by one minute. Ring up the pastor. Say, hey, pastor, somebody's here to see you. And, you know, have that discussion with the pastor. And then, for additional security, have the pastor meet that person at the door before they get buzzed in. And we can do that for anyone. I mean, if somebody's coming to fix the plumbing, it's like, okay, we're calling the facilities manager. We, you know, basically what I'm getting at is this, is we want people to be escorted around the church so they make it to where they need to get, and it's a nice greeting thing to do, but at the same time, they're not wandering around aimlessly and getting into potential problems, you know, creating problems for us. So we need to have some protocols. That's one. That's a very good one. And if they would have had a protocol like this, this may have saved some people's lives, right? Um, he wouldn't have been able just to wander in there and get to shooting. He would have had to at least had a conversation with some people. Now, it still could have happened, right? You know, hindsight's twenty twenty, and this suggestion is not 100%, but can you see how it adds another layer of protection possibly? And there could have been some other signs or things that popped up um, where they could have just called police and let the police respond and pick them up from the front door, you know, that kind of deal. The other thing now, um, in the same vein that we all need to be considering at all times is this, is even during the week or off times, and we're in our offices and we're in our, you know, classrooms or whatever, it's very wise to still have those doors set up in the safety posture. Now, we talk about this a great deal in the active shooter response course. And the, the basic idea is this, is the doors should be in a locked state. 
Now you could still prop the door open. There's all kinds of things you can do, but the door's in a locked state. And so that way, if there is a shooting, all you have to do is you can run into your office if you're not already in there and simply close the door. And then you're immediately safe, safer in that locked office. And so that's the next part that we always have to be thinking about, always considering. You know, I think about if, you know, if I were a Sunday school teacher and I was sitting in my office during the week and I know that I'm kind of relying on the secretary and other people to be my safeguard, I, <laughs> I guess maybe I'm too cynical or whatever, but I would want that door in a locked position so at least I could go shut it. Or even just leaving it shut for a little privacy and be able to do the work, maybe a little bit and quiet and all that good stuff. But then that adds that layer of safety and security. So two things, locked exterior doors on off times during the week, all that kind of stuff. Set up a doorbell so you can let repair people in and delivery people and mail people and all that kind of stuff in. Um, make sure that it's being monitored by a camera, preferably recording. Um, camera and it's monitored by a person to answer the door and then think about escorts for people in and around the church during those times nobody should nobody we don't know should be just wandering around randomly and then finally always maintaining the safety posture where your doors are locked and are e either closed or easily closed just in case something like this happens so other than that, I want to thank you so much for being here. You know, like, share, comment. Um, it's all great stuff. We've had a couple conversations on a couple different situations. Get some, you know, get your opinion, your thoughts and ideas about it. I've um, enjoyed interacting with some of you. And, and then, of course, sometimes some of you have a completely different understanding or perspective of the situations. We have been contacted by people that were actually involved in some of these incidences. And it's great um, when they give some additional information that we didn't know. But anyway, jump in the comment section. You might be surprised what you see there. And while you're there, say something. So other than that, thank you so much for joining us this week. And hey, let's be careful out there. This program is made for informational purposes only and should not be taken as legal advice.